All right, let's get this party started. So exciting. Uh, I love doing this. All right, all right, let's, let's get serious now. This is my serious face. Hello, and welcome to the Infinite Canvas, the screencast. Sorry. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Infinite Canvas, the screencast. Ah. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Infinite Canvas, the screencast for digital storytellers. I'm your hostess with the mostest, Rachel Neighbors. So good of you to join us today. This is our first official episode. There was an unofficial episode zero, but this is the first official one. Since episode zero, I set us up with this site called Patreon. Patreon basically allows creative people to post things sequentially and their patrons can give them a certain amount of money uh, per article or per month or per deliverable, as it were. This allows people to do things they're passionate about that don't necessarily have a marketable product that they can put on a store shelf or sell on an app store. For instance, the Infinite Canvas screencast is just a vlog, and it does take my time, and I'm really excited to be doing it. It's not the sort of thing that I want to put behind a paywall, but if you would like to throw some change my way, it would allow me to, say, get a better microphone. You can find us at patreon.com slash infinite canvas. Today's episode is brought to you by my company, Tin Magpie. And this is a site that I put together pretty quickly because I was writing an article for a list of part, and I specifically mentioned that I was starting my own company in that article and I needed to have a website ready, ASAP, just something. So I made this and it was a lot of fun, especially since because as a designer, I uh, was able to come up with all the assets myself. And while the design is a little bit off the cuff, I did a lot of it in the browser. Basically it went directly from sketchbook to browser. Uh, it's nice because I know enough about, about CSS and how I wanna layer things that I was able to do some nifty tricks. Like you'll notice the expanding background isn't that cool? That's just three different background images using background positioning. And they're, they're all, let me show you. It wouldn't be the infinite canvas if I didn't show you how it works. Look how responsive it is. Isn't that great? I'm using Singularity to handle the grids and I'm using Breakpoint to handle the different breakpoints. Those are both compass, uh, compass extensions, and they are excellent to use. I'm also using scroller. When you scroll down, you see how the birds fly up, all the magpies. I wanted to add a special Easter egg, but I didn't have the time. I was gonna make it so you could actually wind up the, the, the bird and he would fly away and the entire page would change. It would be a lot of fun. And that's sort of the kind of interaction I like to do, but I didn't have the time. So I added some parallax because everybody loves parallax, right? I, I, the joke is that I am not a big fan of parallax, but I will throw it in just for a ooh factor because I think it does look really nice as a way to get birds to fly in. My mouse is a little jumpy. Here's how it is, the more smooth scrolling. So for the background, I actually have, as you can see, three different background images. And there's the one in the middle, the one in the right corner, I mean the left corner and the one in the right corner and I'm using positions to line them up uh, to center to the left and to the right and that's what allows me to get this kind of gritty texture across the top. I just wanted to do it for fun and this is a photograph of myself set as a background image on a div that has a background color. It's a super big background color and uh, it's actually just a transparent white ping. As you can, well, it's not white, it's gray, it's transparent. So I was able to fiddle around with the background color till I got one that I liked. <sighs> and I set the background image to cover so that even when I'm resizing it, it will always focus in so that my eyes are, are looking at you. Let's talk about that a list apart article. I can't think of any better way to kick off our first episode 
then with not one, but two articles on animation on the list apart. The era of animation has begun, people. This is so exciting. I'm in a double header with, with, uh, with Valhead. User interface animation and user experience. A not so secret friendship. And she does a really great job of going in and talking about transitions, animations, how they work. And she's got a lot of lovely demos from CodePen. Uh, I'm very flattered to be in the same building with her about. She wrote the pocket guide to CSS. Uh, and she does CSS animations uh, series on lynda.com. And she is the co-host of the Ladies in Tech podcast. She frequently speaks at events like an event apart. Web animation at work. This is my article. It was very cool to finally write for a list apart because I've been reading a list apart since I first got started in web development and I just loved it. I wrote this article based on a lot of my experience interviewing and talking about web animations in Silicon Valley this year. Well, not just Silicon Valley, I was in Seattle too. I was all over the place. I was in New York, Seattle, uh, everywhere. And a lot of things, I, I noticed that there were some different perspectives on what front end developers, what skills were needed in front end developers. And let's just say that animation was considered, oh, that's nice, it's cute. But I make an argument in web animation at work, my article that, well, Web animations aren't cute. They're necessary for creating a better product. If you want to read the full thing, it's huge. But I put pretty pictures in it, especially to illustrate the different uh, theories behind animation. For instance, uh, when I was at CSS DevConf, there was a wonderful talk about animations. And the author, the, the speaker, pardon, gave a really great example of the illusion of causality. And I tried to illustrate that with this GIF, which is basically that when we watch things on a screen, we assume that things are caused by doing something, but that's all an illusion. For instance, here, depending on when the blue circle moves, we see this as either being a bump or we see it as being a chase. But the blue and the red circle have no influence on each other. They're just pixels on a screen. It's your brain that makes that inference based on which one moves when. Sort of like when you click a button and a form disappears, you assume that clicking the button caused the form to disappear, not that the form was always going to disappear and you just happened to click the button at the right time. That's something very special about how the human mind works. And there are other animals on the planet whose minds work similarly. We tend to call them higher functioning uh, intelligent animals. So that was interesting. I enjoyed making all of these gifts. Feel free to share them. Just, you know, I appreciate it if you leave my little URL on there. But I wrote this specifically so that you could hand it around to perhaps you're a manager and you want to make the case for, oh, I need more animation talent or people with animation backgrounds or spend more time learning different kinds of animation. That this is the sort of article that you could take to your higher up to get get permission to spend more time on, on animation. Or if you want to spend more time on animation, this article is a great jumping off point, just, not just to make that argument, but also to find resources and people to follow. And somebody in the comments, I said that transitions were a very unnatural, um, mostly human invention, as you'll see here. The whole fade to black thing doesn't really exist in nature. Uh, we don't have a, a natural corollary, whereas with ex we have like acceleration and deceleration and all sorts of other things that, you know, active skeuomorphisms that animation brings. I said that transitions don't really have any natural counterpart. And somebody in the comments, I think this comment needs to be needs to be called out because it is a good comment. Alan Bauchop pardon me if I've mispronounced your name, said, transitions have endless counterparts in nature. Blink slowly and observe. Go from a lit room out into the dark. Night to day, the tides. Nature is in a continual state of transition. It's all a matter of time frame or timeline. Ha. I'd flip it around and say that stasis is a human invention. That's really a good idea, and I hadn't thought about it that way. Well said, Alan.
recently, I, this was brought to my attention, written by a certain Paul, somebody who works for Google on the Chrome Dev Relations team as an advocate. Paul said that we will use will change in the future instead of using uh, things like translate to kick to kick individual images and layers over to the GPU. For instance, when I frequently kick things over to the GPU. For instance, whenever you have a lot of things moving rapidly on the page, it's a good idea if you can kick individual ones over for processing by the graphic processing unit. For instance, in this one, Tuna on this panel could be sent to the GPU separately from everything moving in the background. And it's having trouble recording this and running it, which is an example of jank. Even when we send individual things over, even when we send individual things over to the GPU, if the GPU is weak or even if it's non-existent, we have to use the CPU instead on some devices. It's still problematic. But it's nice to know that in the future, we can just declare it by using will change. He says that you could have used, will, at, originally they were going to call it will animate, but now it's called will change because not necessarily everything you want to send to the GPU is animated. Sometimes it's just more efficient to handle it there. So that will help reduce Chang. I'm really excited to see this. Reading this article though also brought me over to this other one that Paul wrote called The Web Needs Containment. And this is very, very interesting. Uh, basically what it comes down to is that the, a lot of what we make these days isn't just documents. We're not just making documents with HTML anymore. We're making apps, we're making animations, we're making games, we're making all kinds of things. They require state management, views, controllers, models. And we have so many model view contain, uh, model view controller systems because this uh, current system isn't meeting our requirements for what we're trying to do with the tools we have. And this makes sense to me. It's sort of like uh, anti-aging formulations that you see in the cosmetics style. If any of them were working, there wouldn't be so many of them and there wouldn't be new ones every year. So it's a, an indication that there is something people are trying to do and we haven't quite achieved it yet. So he makes a very good argument for why we need to contain things. This is, it's an article worth read, reading because I was never a Flash developer, but he brings up some, he, he has some experience with this. And he brings up some interesting things about how uh, Flash would contain certain things. Now containment gets around this whole idea of uh, sending things over to the GPU, repainting the screen. And the problem with the way things currently work is that your screen and its rendering is kind of daisy chained together. If you change, you know, if you pluck one thing out from the top, the whole thing needs to be redone and it has to be completely repainted. And that's annoying if you're only changing a little tiny section of it, right? So it becomes interesting. Uh, for instance, with iframes, technically you can, you can do that and it's really fast, but you can't style things in iframes. And then, well, what about web components? Well, couldn't they blow away other designs? So it's, it's really worth reading this entire thing. And I am excited to see more from this particular prowl. Lazy block layout, CSS containment, will animate. This is, it's interesting because recently, recently there was this big, this big butting of heads between Jeff Croft uh, saying that the time of the HTML star is over, that we've, we've got it figured out. People can make perfectly good looking, responsive data on the internet and nobody needs someone who's following all the browser bugs and stuff. And Jeffrey Zeldman was like, I was never arguing that we did need HTML gurus. I argued that we need good stewards and people to keep a firm hand on the on the, the wheel of the ship and it's interesting to read them both. And it's also interesting because they both have these perspectives 
um, or at least I feel like they both have perspectives of coming from a very static web point of view. If you're at all on the interactive side of things, you no, know, things aren't cut and dry. It's the war is still going on out there. How do we handle this? How do we get performance up? How do we know what's happening where and when? And then you get these lovely little bugs that very few people know about, but like this lovely one that Anna Tudor pointed out, which is, check this out. <sighs> Don't set overflow hidden on uh, elements with 3D transform children, because check out what happens when you do. The back doesn't show because the backside is considered overflow, I suppose. Who would know this? I mean, what I'm, it, it's, it's insane, the sort of things that you have to know about browser hacks, about all the different options for animation these days. Are you gonna use SVG? Are you gonna use Canvas? Are you gonna use CSS? Are you gonna go with some JavaScript? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do, huh, huh, huh? You know, no, nobody's just like, oh, well, we're good. We don't need any advocates anymore. It's all done. Let's bake the specs and never revisit how how html is made ever again there's still a lot to be done especially with the sort of ambitious things that we're trying to do with the internet now the browser is definitely not just a document reader and in the wake of flash we are still trying to find out how to make this work there are a lot of lessons we can learn from how flash did things i guess that's why it's kind of painful when i go to go to an event and you know, it's it's easy and cheap to make jokes about Flash, but there were a lot of things that Flash was doing right, and I hope that we can still learn from that and use those lessons to help make how browsers render and perform the new interactions we're creating without Flash more efficiently. We have to remember the right way to do things, and we have to always strive for a better way to do things. Indeed, perhaps we have found really good ways to do things for the current state of the web, but the web is ever-changing. There are people coming online now who have completely different device spreads and connectivity than we have and have had for the past 10 years. How do we cater to them? Imagine if you could check out what kind of network connection your visitor had, and then you could send them different assets depending on what sort of connection they had. For instance, someone had a really bad, laggy dial-up connection or a fritzy um, mobile one, you could send them 8-bit graphics instead of like an alpha transparent pin. You could do all kinds of things or, you know, skip sending a video and instead send them a comic page. I love the idea of this network information API. I hope to see it take off. This is what I mean when I say we still have a lot of work left to do. I think there will always be space for gatekeepers to push the web forward. Speaking of specialized skills and weird, tricky knowledge that you need in today's web design environment, my front end master's animation storytelling class is up. Basically, this is everything I know about using CSS3 and HTML5 and combining the two uh, with animations with audio and sometimes not with audio and just with JavaScript. I cover a lot of little gotchas, a lot of performance tricks. It was a lot of fun to give this workshop and the video and the experiment, uh, exercises and experiments are now available at frontendmasters.com. Frontendmasters is a really cool site, by the way, with a lot of different courses. At only $40 a month, it's worth getting a subscription to it for at least one month and just running through and doing all of these cool classes. They have an in-depth one with Estelle Whale on CSS3, which is totally worth checking out. I love it. Uh, web user inter, uh, pardon, web UI architecture Garen Means, who is totally awesome. There's Ben Callahan on responsive web design. He gives this workshop quite a bit. He's awesome. And JavaScript, the good parts with Douglas Crockford. You actually get to watch the Crockford, and he answers people's questions. It's a lot of fun. A lot of different formats. It's cool to check out the free previews, see if the format works for you. Different people learn in different ways. And mine has a little preview too. So definitely check it out. Let me know what you think. I hope you enjoy it. And if you so happen to be in London on April 7th, I hope you'll stop by Future of Web Design where I will be giving a similar workshop and 
it's going to be so much fun. Hope I will see you there. I recently checked out Snap SVG. This has been around for a little while, and although you would not know it from the website, this is an Adobe project, the Adobe Web, web Platform team. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what their official byline on this is, but it's all on GitHub, and it's a library that lets you do animations with SVG. It's. I'm. I am really digging the crocodile on here. SVG is one of the next things that I want to really dig into. I haven't found the time because I've been too busy running around talking about JavaScript and CSS, but I will make time for it. Have you used Snap SVG? Do you animate things with SVG? I want to hear your story. For those of you who aren't in the know, SVG basically stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. It's kind of like the output that people used to get out of Flash or Illustrator and make web animations, except now you can do it directly in the browser. It's pretty cool. So if you have used this in a project, please send me a link. I want to see what you've done. Maybe you'll get featured in a future episode. Recently, there was this conference called Visualized, and it was in New York. And look at this. It's nothing but storytellers. I don't know any of these people, and it makes me feel very guilty. I, I should because, you know, Infinite Canvas, screencast for storytellers, uh, Tin Magpie, all we do is tell stories with code. So this is right up my alley, and I only found out about it too late to actually make, the, uh, make plans to go there. But I'm hoping that I'll get to go next year. Uh, maybe if I s find a way to submit a talk to them, they'll let me speak. I hope so. But more importantly, one of the gems to fall out of this event was this particular talk called The Weight of Rain. And this is by Jonathan Coram. He works for the New York Times. Yes, the New York Times team that puts together all those really cool interactive stories like Snowfall uh, and a couple of other neat things. I think it was a case of shark and minnow. I mentioned it in the List Apart article. I'm a big fan of the work that New York Times does with their interactive team. I hope they'll keep up their best efforts. So the way to frame is completely broken down slide for slide with little text next to it. Put your iPad in a plastic bag, take a bath, and watch this. Just, you know, scroll your way through it, take your time. It's really beautiful. It's, I'm, I'm so sad I didn't get to go to this conference if this is a, if this is an example of the sort of things that were that were there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it my best to make it next year. So what have I been working on? I've been working on this illustrated storybook for an article for Adobe Inspire written by Raymond Camden. Basically it runs through how you can make illustrations animated using Adobe Edge Animate and pause and restart them depending on where people are scrolling. It's interesting and it's fun. I look forward to the chance to write articles like this based on using different, uh, using different user interfaces and software because I'm always getting questions about them when I'm speaking. And it's nice to have some actual in the field experience, know what works, what's performant, what, what outputs to which browsers and the different problems I've run into with them or haven't run into. So I created this one. This is the three tales of Hoodie Crow. I took my three favorite fables about crows, and I updated them for the modern world. Updating is kind of what I do. I didn't like the idea of using a bunch of lore myths and text, so I created some illustrations. I got them animated. A couple of cute little design elements, like this robin. I'm using repeating background images to completely randomize these, these tree trunks on each side. I'll show you how those work. And the neat thing is the illustrations pause when you scroll away, and then they continue when you scroll back. So this is my first Tin Magpie project, a lot of fun. Let me show you how these cool backgrounds work. Oh, that's huge. So basically, I have this uh, folder div because I have certain things leaking in front of it or behind it. 
This forest div is basically just a standalone wrapper that sits underneath everything else. And it's got a Z index that I can use to position some things behind it, some things in front of it. For instance, the pond and the bushes are behind it, but these bushes down here are in front of it. All of this code will be made available for you to check out when it goes live in Adobe's Inspire magazine. Still a few issues out, but be patient. As you can see, these are a lot of different images, different background images, but they like the, the bark on the left repeats. It's a completely different side from the bark size from the bark on the right. So they're never repeating at exactly the same time. It's staggered. And I have a couple of images. So I've got different images and like this is a little tiny branch and it will be here and it will repeat but because it's got so much uh, white space beneath it it won't repeat for a long time and each one of these is a different amount of white space so they look pretty random i even gave them some offsets so they wouldn't be like a big pile of uh, a big pile up of leaves at the top of the page anyway i love using multiple background images they're so much fun my only complaint is that it's hard to use sprites with multiple background images. You do have to use a lot of different images and keep them as separate files. And that can mean more HTTP requests, which can mean slower load time. Compress the heck out of your files and hope for the best. Maybe one day we'll be able to use clipping masks on sprites so that we can do something like this with background images. But for the time being, we're stuck like this. So keep an eye out on Adobe Inspire, which has a lovely app. That'll be going live on Adobe Inspire sometime in the next couple of months, along with another animation or two I put together. Hope you will enjoy it. They have a beautiful iPad app. You should totally check it out. Now, I did put all of my materials for making this up on Forced. So if you want to see more about my process, I even posted the sketch that I do before I, um, as you can see, I use a bright color to draw the animations from the dropping of the chicken nugget and the fox's tail wagging and the pebbles and such. But uh, this is, I tend to post a lot of my thoughts and my doodles on Forced, including my in progress shots. So this all brings us over to one of our first questions here was from the wonderful Micah Godbolt. He gave a really great talk at CSS DevConf about CSS 3D transformations. If you can see him give that talk, go see it. It's totally worth the time. But he asked me specifically, we ended up having this conversation where he said uh, it, it was great to see my, my process on Hoodie Crow and he, he wanted to draw more than a stick figure. And I was like, well, practice makes better. And it's also useful to spend a little time each day drawing. A lot of developers I meet say, oh, I couldn't draw. I'm not good at drawing, which is weird because every developer I know does tech writing and not every developer I know is good at tech writing but it's really easy to tap on a keyboard and put words on a page. Writing for a list apart taught me that editors do a lot of work to make, there's a, let's put it this way, editors do a lot of work to make an article go from a lot of information vomited on the page to a respectable article that could impact a community in a positive way. It's the same with art. You can draw. But it's a lot easier to see that your art looks like crap than it is to look at your blog post and think that it looks like crap. So my advice is that art, like writing, should be practice. You may be a developer and you may not feel like you have any artistic ability, but that doesn't matter. You should still practice just because the practice will help you understand art better, which will let you work better with people who do do art better than you do. One of the things I like to do every morning, regardless of whether or not I'm going to, regardless of whether or not I'm going to do any 
anything artistic that day is I like to do something that we like to call warm-up sketches. I usually work with 800 by 600 because it's small and it's silly. And at this size, I'm not going to feel like my heart is broken if I don't live up to my expectations. It's like, oh, it's an ugly small size. Of course it came out terrible, right? Michael wanted to know how I would suggest getting better at art and at drawing and sketching. How, could, how can you out there get better? Maybe you're an artist who's not doing very much art in your day-to-day -day work and you're worried that your skills are slipping behind. Or maybe you're a person who's not an artist who would like to start doing a little art on the side, either in hopes of being able to illustrate your own articles or your own, your own projects like I do, or maybe just because you want to be able to talk more with other artists and have a common vocabulary with them. It's the same with wanting, a, wanting to teach an artist code so that they can talk better with developers. When you both have a common vocabulary, you can make really beautiful things together, really important things together. I do warm-up sketches. Now, you can use a sketchbook, but I use a digital stylus because I don't like scanning things, and I love the immediate gratification of posting some, something I've done that I really like on a site like Dribbble or DeviantArt and feeling a lot of uh, external validation and love from the community for that. So I'm using Photoshop, but you can use GIMP, you can use whatever you like, or you can use a wonderful sketchbook that doesn't require a license. And I'm using a set of brushes that I got from the creative market, Kyle's Ultimate Brushes. And I love these because they're just so creative and inventive. And I'm really into using them these days. When I'm doing production work, I use Manga Studio and I draw uh, very smooth looking lines, but when I'm doing doodles, when I'm playing around with ideas, I use his faux natural brushes and really let go. And I try to use very few layers when I'm doing something like this because I feel like layers make us feel, uh, make us feel like we can take it back too easily. And you should be fairly committal when you're drawing. You should feel strong, like this is a decision you're making and it's okay no matter how it works out. This isn't, this is, nobody's gonna judge you on this. And if they are, they're not very nice people. These are warm up sketches. So first you just start by getting used to how it feels to doodle. Hmm, this is fun, right? And you just do some squiggly shapes. Just do something abstract, maybe play around. I don't need this menu, pop. Play, play around with some patterns a little. I like doing a scallop pattern. Um, you might see this pattern a lot on kimonos, especially with regards to bird's feathers or koi scales. I used to have a red golden phoenix, sorry, a red golden pheasant, and he, he had these cape feathers that looked just like this. But they're fun to do, and you never know when something you're drawing like this will become uh, terrible. Uh, you never know when drawing something like this will give you the idea for a new approach to a design problem. This usually takes 15 minutes to half an hour. I tend to do these sorts of things in the middle of stand-ups. So when people are talking about stuff that doesn't involve me, I'll just stand over here and nod and be like, yeah, huh? Yeah, huh? Ooh, I like this pen. Yeah, huh? <laughs> After you feel confident with your pen, and mine's being wonky because I've got Camtasia running right now, once you feel confident with your pen, make like a solid background in your chosen color du jour. I'm gonna use this kind of purple. No, no, no. I'll use mint green. Mint green is soft. There we go. Color du jour. And then you have a layer for drawing on. I advise that you get your camera and pick out some pictures that you've taken recently. They can be selfies. They could be pictures you took on a recent trip somewhere. It could be like a snowy scene, like the one outside my windows. And you just pick it out, or you could find one online. And then you're going to do something really, really simple. It's so simple that even if you have no artistic talent, you should do it. Pick a slightly darker color and start blocking in uh, different grounds. So there's a real trick when it comes to storyboard and animation development. Most of the times we limit ourselves to three levels of brightness uh, in our tools, black, gray, and white. And 
in the morning you just do a bunch of these little rectangular sketches using these different saturations to represent different levels of your field of vision. For instance, I've done the background in white and the foreground in this slightly darker color. And I'm going to perhaps do a color in the midground for the buildings in the darkest. And it doesn't have to look good. This is only moderately good looking. But I'm already starting to think about depth and shape and how things relate to each other. And they're not all going to be home runs. You're not always going to walk away from this stuff with, a, with something that you want to show your parents. I advise you just group them up into little groups and continue on your merry way. So after a while, after doing a couple of these, you might start thinking a little bit more adventurously and you might start trying to do compositions. Now, it can be fun to do some compositions like a comic book panel. For instance, here's a person in the foreground, right? And we're going to grab a person over here, and this person will be making a, a plea. Oh, this person's so sad. He's got his little hands up. Why are you doing this to me? I'm going to die. I'm so alone. Mm. That's a terrible shot that I'm cutting him off there. There, he's at a, a breakfast table. He was like, why are you telling me I can't eat this cereal? It's so, I love this cereal and you're just, you're against me and everything I do. I mean, it tells a story, of course. Now let's see, we need to give it a little bit more grade because this is essentially right now line work on a white background. And the point of this is that we're trying to show depth. We're trying to indicate importance, hierarchy, and spatial relationships with color. And now I'm just erasing some of what I just did so that it's not a big blob. There you go. And this is a perfectly valid way to spend your morning time during a meetup. I mean, during a talk or or while you're communicating with your boss, if you can kind of partition off part of your brain, or maybe you're talking to your family on the phone, and it's one of those times where you can kind of let a little bit of your brain wander for creative pursuits, but you don't want to completely give your brain over to thought. This is perfect for that. It's a good little exercise. It's a not very mentally taxing. It's very relaxing. And every day it lets you get a little bit better at communicating visually just a little bit. So I always like to draw uh, this one face over and over again, and it's my own face really. I'm always drawing myself from this angle. This or birds. I love birds. That's why so many of my animations have cats or birds in them, because I can draw cats and birds really fast. I should try something a little bit harder like orcas in the future. But you can see somebody's trying to get in the camera here, too. And this is also a perfectly good warm up sketch. It doesn't all have to be tonal value experiments. Sometimes it's just doodling. This isn't finished. This isn't an art masterwork. I can put this on dribble and nobody will give it a single heart. But it's a good way to start the day. So hope this has been inspiring for you. If you do warm up doodles, I'd love to see them. Please send a link and I will be happy to have a look. It's very inspiring for me to see other people trying these same techniques from day to day. Thank you so much for joining us on our inaugural episode of the Infinite Canvas Streamcast. You've been a great bunch of people to talk with and I appreciate all of the questions that you sent 
I'll do my best to answer them. If you have any questions of your own, email me at hello at theinfinitecanvas.com and I will do my best to answer them in a future episode, maybe even give live demos like I did for Micah. We will be having guest hosts soon, so if there's anybody you'd like to see speak, send their name along. I'll do my best to get in touch with them. If you enjoyed this screencast or you want to see more, please check out our Patreon page. We would love to have your attention and we will be posting extra special updates and such there. I'm Rachel Neighbors and this has been The Infinite Canvas. Can't wait to see what you create next week.